Robert is going to finish out this FCA with um, by speaking tonight, and I can't. I think we're gonna continue um, FCA over the break, but we'll definitely let you guys know about that um, later. But yeah, for now, I'm just gonna go ahead and pray us in, and then Robert will take it over. So bow your heads, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day, and thank you for all these people on this call. Um, thank you for bringing them here tonight, God, and I pray that you'll speak through Robert and that every single person can take something away from this message. Um, I just pray that you'll use Robert for big things, um, that you'll continue to work in his heart as he pours out to us. And just thank you again for all of these people that have um, dedicated their time to this, Lord. Um, and I just pray that you'll grow their hearts and be with them this week, and just give Robert the words to say and the wisdom. And we love you and thank you for everything. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Right. And thank you so much, Kirsten. Uh, man, I hope you guys have had a great Monday. And uh, man, hard to believe that we are as deep as we are into November, uh, being November the 16th. And that, man, this week finishes it up for you guys. And then it's going to be about six weeks before we see some of you. Uh, something like that. And so, man, we hope you have a great break. Um, as you heard Kirsten say, uh, we as a leadership team right now are in the process of talking about what are Monday nights going to look like um, kind of through after Thanksgiving through some of the Christmas break. And since we've been doing it by Zoom anyway, it's not anything that you guys would have to get used to. So um, uh, stay in touch with that. Keep following on social media. And uh, if that's the case, then we would look to get going two weeks from tonight. And uh, we'll go ahead and take next week off since it's the week of Thanksgiving. Uh, let you enjoy all of that and hopefully just spend some great family time. Uh, man, tonight we're going to finish up this whole semester. We have been looking at different parables. And um, so with that, um, man, hopefully you have seen and realized that, man, Jesus was an absolutely incredible teacher. Uh, in fact, there are a lot of people that they, they look at scripture and they wouldn't say that necessarily he's the son of God. But, man, most everybody can agree that um, he was an unbelievable teacher in what he was able to do. And as you look at the parables, they definitely show us that, that he was skilled at being able to talk about the things of God, the thing of heaven, um, and put them in very ordinary, everyday situations that the people then would know exactly what he was talking about, either because they had just seen it, or for some of them, they actually lived it. And so for him to incorporate who God is, what his role is in regards to God, being the son of God, um, and just what the kingdom of God looks like, um, man, he was just remarkable in that way. And uh, man, I want to give a huge shout out to our leadership team because every one of them back um, at, the, at the end of the summer, beginning of the semester, when we talked about what do we want to teach on these Monday nights, and we kind of got down to the parables, um, man, I think our leadership team has just absolutely crushed it every Monday night. Uh, with the preparation they've done and putting it in terms where hopefully you've walked away with something. Um, man, if not a, a question answered, I love the fact that sometimes maybe we walk away and we still have questions that we need to chew on. Um, Jesus had no problem with that at all. And so tonight, um, man, we want to finish it off with the parable of the three servants or can also be seen as the parable of the talents. And tonight, we're going to be looking at Matthew 25, 14 through 30. And just to give you a little bit of a backdrop on what all of that looks like, you can also find a similar parable um, of the servant or the talents in Luke 19. And as you look at Luke 19, when it starts off in verse 11, it says that the crowd was listening to everything Jesus said. And because he was nearing Jerusalem, he told them the story to correct the impression that the kingdom of God would begin right away. And so you, you look at where in Luke and even in Matthew, where we get this story that Jesus relayed. 
and it's right before he goes to Jerusalem, or as it says here on the screen, right as he headed into what we call Holy Week, which was the week that he spent before he went to the cross, before he was put in the grave, and before he came back to life, or the big word, resurrection. All right, and so men, you stop and think about it. If somebody is giving you, in a sense, some of their last words, are they not important? I mean, whether that somebody is about to leave, like if you're getting ready to leave college and you've got a good relationship with your parents and they, they give you some final instructions or something that they want to know that, man, this is important. And that's why I'm waiting to tell you this until you leave. And so just by the nature of where Jesus placed this story, we see the importance of it. Um, one of the other quick backdrop things in Luke is there again, the people would have understood, especially what Jesus was talking about. Now, the, the two parables in Matthew and Luke don't necessarily go just stride for stride, but they really do overlap. And in Luke, Jesus was talking about how the, the master or the leader went away. And what had happened about that time, Herod, who was king over the Jews and everything, he had actually left and had died and he was leaving the kingdom to his three sons and he was leaving a piece of the kingdom to each one of them well there were some who didn't want his sons to be the king and so they actually went to caesar and were making appeal to caesar to not let his sons take the throne hang on just a second i gotta let my wife in <laughs> so um um, they didn't want his sons, and so they're making an appeal while he's gone to not have him come in and be the king. And so there's this activity that's going on, and it just flowed right into what we're going to see in the story. So, uh, man, tonight what we're going to do, we're going to look at Matthew 25, um, 14 through 30. And uh, some of our leadership team are going to jump in and read these pieces for us. So, Judson, why don't you start us off? And as it gets to the breaks, man, just the next person, jump in. All right. Uh, verse 14. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went home to also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. Yep, in verse 19, after a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Okay, picking up in verse 24, my version's a little different, but it says, He... He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, saying, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers and at my coming i should have received what was my own interest
And then in verse 28, it says, and then he ordered, take the money from his servant and give it to the one with the 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant out into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So man, team, thank you guys so much for jumping in and reading and piecing the story together for us. Um, man, one of the things that I absolutely love about the fact of the parables is hopefully they can help you paint a great word picture of what's going on. So obviously you have a master, you have a king, you have somebody's in charge and he brings in three and to one he gives five, to one he gives two and to another he gives one. And so, man, I want us to just look at what all did it mean um, for him to, um, to do all of that and trying to figure out why my slides won't go. Man, come on. Let's see. Well, nuts. You gotta love it when that happens. We're frozen. All right, we'll just go on. We'll just keep looking at that and we'll keep rolling with it. So, um, man, the first thing that I wanna talk to you about is gifts given, all right? Um, so when we hear about uh, him giving money, in one of the versions it talks about him giving money. And with that, there originally he was talking about weight. It wasn't so much an amount of money in silver and all of that. It had to do with weight. And so when you talk about these heavy bags, I mean, it could be as much as 75 pounds a bag. And then as the story goes, we kind of switched it over to where it helps us make more sense, where you sit there and you go, man, if he had been given them an absorbent amount of money, in other words, that one of these bags themselves could have lasted them years. And so you get this picture that man to the one who had given five, it was a huge amount that he had given him. And even to the one that he only gave one, it was so much more than they would have normally seen in their lifetime and in what they were doing. And you stop and you think about it and you sit there and you think, okay, here's the deal. And then the master gave each one of these people what he saw fit to give them. It's not that he brought them in and he said, well, I've got, to, I've got three people here. I've got to give each one of them exactly the same. No, to one, he said, man, you're going to get five. You're going to get two. You're going to get one. And so with the master being in charge, he has the right to do that. He has the right to distribute the gifts that he's giving them as he sees fit. And that's one of the things that we realize about God is that God looks at each one of us. He created you individually and unique. And with that, he has given each one of us, men, a different set of gifts or a different set of talents. And it's not that it's all equaled out to where you sit there and you say, man, I'm going to make sure that everybody has this. But if you come down to it, you understand at the bare minimum, everybody at least has one talent that they've received from God. And so we all have been given gifts. And man, there's an expectation that goes with that. Um, man, I'm going to call on one of our leadership crew. They have been learning some scripture. And I want to see, can one of you guys give us Romans 12, verse 1? All right, I'll go for it. Um, <laughs> Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present yourselves a living sacrifice, um, holy and acceptable to the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Romans 12, 1. And thank you, Zoe. That's it. And there was no prompting to that whatsoever, guys. That was straight off the cuff to see. Um, dude, they have been working hard memorizing scripture. And if you stop and think about that, man, what are we to do with the gifts? There's an expectation. And if you look at Romans 12, 1, basically it talks about, man, our whole life, everything we do should be worship. 
And so in other words, hopefully what these guys did is they took the talents that they were given, they took the money that they were given and really in a sense used it in a way that it would be seen as a, as a way of worship or as a way of offering to make the most of what they had been given. All right. So first of all, gifts given. Second of all, gifts used and unused. Man, how many of you guys remember, and it's not as long ago for you guys as it was for me, but man, when you're in elementary school and the teacher looks at you and says, hey, I need everybody to just keep working. I've got to run down to the office real quick. I will be right back. And yeah, some of you are grinning, so you've been there and everything. And man, I remember clearly, honestly, man, that the second the teacher was out the door, somebody would give a little bit of time and then boom, somebody's up there and they're cracking the door open to see if what, if they can see the teacher coming. And dude, the room starts off silent, but it starts getting louder and louder and people start getting up out of their chairs and it's all of a sudden, man, there's a party going on in that elementary room. Why? Well, we know that the teacher is gone. We know the master's gone. Here's the deal. We don't know when she's coming back. And we always posted that person. Now, sometimes it worked out and they caught a glimpse of the teacher coming. And sometimes, man, they missed it. And boom, she opens the door, person standing there. We're all busted. And that's a silly illustration, but I want you to put it in this context with the athletic ability that you've been given. How do you act when the coach isn't around? If you're on drills and you're supposed to be working, whether that's in the weight room, whether that's in the film room, whether that's on the field or the court, if the coaches leave and leave you to your own, man, how do you react? And if it's something seriously where the coaches actually do leave and you know in your mind they're going to be back, the question becomes, man, what do you want to, want to, want to find, want them to find you doing? And so Jesus paints this picture. And there again, one of the things that he was telling them is, hey, I want you to understand, you guys think when I say I'm going away that I'm immediately coming back. And so he was trying to get them to understand that, yes, he was going to the cross, going to the grave. He was coming back, but then he was going to the Father. And so, man, in that time until Christ returns, the question comes, if we've all been given talents, what are we doing with them? Look at what it says about the one of the five, all right? It says that, man, he took and he invested the money. In other words, we don't exa know exactly what he did, but, man, he took the five that he had been given, and he found a way to double those. And so, man, I am, not a, I am not a math whiz, I am not a financial whiz, but I do know for somebody to get huge turnaround, sometimes that involves high risk. And if it happens, then man, just like that, you go from five to 10. The one who had been given two did what? Says that he invested well and he came back and he got two more, so he comes back with four. And then you've got the one dude that sits there and he says, man, here's what I know about the master. The master is hard. Man, he takes from things that he hasn't worked himself. And yet, so, man, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just not going to do anything with this. And it even says that he dug a hole, he buried it. And that when the master finally did come back, he digs it up and he takes it back in. And so, man, I want you to stop and think. Um, isn't it interesting that Jesus uses this story to talk about a master who is going away but would definitely be coming back? And in reality, he's given us a picture of himself. Man, people have been trying to predict when is Jesus coming back? When is Jesus coming back? And sometimes I wonder, man, these people who are trying to figure that out, why? Is it really that, man, they just can't wait and they're anticipating coming back? Or is it kind of that thing of, man, I want to do my own thing, but also kind of want to have an idea when he gets back so that when he gets back, I get myself kind of cleaned up and everything's all rocking and going well when the master returns. But I love the piece of the story that we move to of, man, the gifts rewarded or the gifts taken, which would be the third part. So the master returns. And one by one, he starts calling them in. And he sits there and he says, man, I want to know what you did with what I gave you. And um, you see, starting in um, verse 18 
uh, 19, it says, after a long time, the master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used their money. Man, make special attention of the words that are used in scripture. You see, to give an account doesn't just mean I want to tell you the story, man. If you're asking me to give an account of something that happened, I'm giving you detail by detail by detail by detail of what took place. So when the master comes in, it says to the servant whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward and he said, master, you gave me five to invest and I've earned five more. And I love the master's response in verse 21. It says that the master was full of praise. Man, who of us on this call don't like it when somebody praises us, man? We all do. And that's not a prideful thing or an arrogant thing. But man, when we have done something well, it's nice when somebody recognizes that. And man, you stop and think about it. When your coach gives you praise for something that you did, man, doesn't that feel good? And there again, it's not an arrogant thing, but you're sitting there going, they recognize that I did a job well done. And maybe they weren't there to see all that I put in for that one moment that they did see. And they saw the return on that. And so, man, I love the fact that Jesus is so concerned about what he's given us that he would be willing to sit there and say, um, Man, number one, I recognize that the talents I gave you, you have put to use. And because of that, I want to celebrate with you. And on top of that, I'm going to give you even more responsibility. And the same thing happens with the second one. And then the third one comes in. And man, it's a totally different tone. And man, we've all been there on a field or a court when the coach comes in and maybe catches somebody doing something that they're not supposed to be doing or something that's going against what the coach has asked. And man, they, in a sense, almost just blow up on that person. Have you ever been there when a teammate is just getting chewed out? And it is so uncomfortable for everybody because I mean, you're standing there watching this go on and you're trying to put yourself in their place. And man, you sit there and you think, man, that is harsh. If this picture depicts, if this story depicts, you know, Jesus or God in relationship to us, I mean, man, is that really who God is? Absolutely. We've got to take in the whole expanse of who God is and what his character is. We can't just sit there and say, well, God is love. Absolutely he is. And all love springs from him. But there is so much more to the character of God. That's why we have to look at all of scripture. And so he's looking at this one person and he's sitting there saying, man, I gave you one talent. All you had to do was risk it. At least risk it. If you knew that I am a harsh person, at least from your words, then why didn't you even at least risk losing it? I would have in much more rather you do that than to just bury it in the ground. And so here's what's going to happen. Take what was given to this dude and give it to the one who now has 10 and get this one out of here. And the same thing, man, you look at all of that and you think, golly, that's harsh, but I want you to look at it this way. Let's look at this real quick on the gifts given and rewarded and the gifts taken and done away with. First of all, man, if we think that, well, if I just do what Jesus wants, then man, Number one, when he comes back and he's going to be happy, what he's going to do is, man, he's going to let me just celebrate and relax and chill. No, actually, look at what it is that when he's blessing you and giving you more responsibility, that actually leads to more work. But it's the work that we do, not works, but it's the work that we do when we're offering it all up to him that he's pleased with. And it's kind of one of those things as athletes, as the leadership team, as we've been doing some studies on Sunday nights, we've been looking at, do you see your sport as a pedestal that's to draw attention to you or do you see it as a platform? And then if you see it as a platform for God to get the glory, then man, here's what's going to happen is you use the athletic ability that he's given you and he's going to begin to expand that platform. And it's going to give you even more opportunity to serve him and live your life through your sport for him. And it's the same with life. Man, if you guys 
as you look towards, man, your wedding and all of that and the kind of husband that you want to be and the kind of dad that you want to be, then, man, the gifts that God's given us as men to do that, man, if we steward that well, then he's going to continue to give us a bigger platform in order, what? To serve our wives better, to serve our families better. Ladies, man, whatever it is that is in your brain right now, uh, man, this is what I want to take and do with my life. This is the profession that I want to do. Man, stop and think about if you offer that to him as a gift that he's given you and you invest it and the return on that is, and he gives you a bigger platform to live and speak for him in the, in the work that you do. And so, man, it's this idea that with more, the responsibility is greater. And yet he knows we're up to the challenge or he wouldn't give it to us to begin with. Unless we take it and say, well, I'll tell you what, I really don't see how this is going to benefit me if I do it for God. So really, I'm going to hold on to it for myself and I'm just going to bury this thing. And that's the only time that God looks at us and says, man, you foolish person. I gave you this to use. I gave you this to risk. And you weren't even willing to risk one bag. And he says, so man, take it and send this guy away. If you look at John 15, um, as we wrap this up and get you guys ready to, to go to breakout rooms, man, when we look at the summary of this in verses 29 and 30, here's what I want us to focus on. What is it that God has given you for his glory? What is it that God has given you for his glory? And are you willing to risk it? How are you investing it? And how are you growing it? And I know that's a lot right there, all right? But man, how are you risking it? How are you investing it? How are you growing it? And the thing that I've got to remember then is, it's not about my kingdom, it's about his. There's a master in this story. The kingdom in this story belonged to the master. It didn't belong to the ones that he gave the talents to. And if I take the talent that he gave me and I don't give him any recognition in it, that's in a sense me saying, tell you what, I'm the ruler there. I'm the one in charge. I'll do with this as I see fit, and I'm just going to bury this thing. But when I realize that it's his, and it's his kingdom, then that moves us back to what we were just talking about. I invest it, I risk it, I grow it. And it's an amazing thing when we do that with the talent that God has given us. John 15 talks, 15, 15 talks about the fact that Jesus moves us when we come into a relationship with him from quote unquote a servant to a friend and all of a sudden he brings us into a different relationship and i don't know about you but man you think about those two words and how do i want to be known as in relationship to jesus man do i just always want to be seen as a servant now true my life needs to serve him but do i want to be called a servant or do i want to be called a friend and man, to me, the answer is pretty obvious. I would love to be the friend of Jesus. And there again, not to kick back and chill with him, but for him to sit there and say, man, you've been faithful with a little. Let me give you a little bit more and let's see what you do with that. So man, the parable of the talents or the parable of the servants. And here's what I love, man, looking at all of you guys on this screen. Um, man, each one of you are blessed in so many ways. Some of the ways I know because I've seen you on the court, I've seen you on the field, I've seen the athletic ability that he's given you. But for some of you that I know a little bit better, I also know other things about your life. And so man, we're gonna give you opportunity to uh, go into the breakout rooms and uh, dive into some questions. And uh, man, as, as we always say every week, man, at least participate in the breakouts. Um, if you just want to go in there and you don't really feel like, man, I, I just don't feel comfortable opening up yet, great. Just listen to the questions because you can at least write down the answers for yourself to look at in how you see all of this. So, man, you guys take the next few minutes and uh, then we'll bring everybody back.